<clears throat> Hello, Senior Scholars, I'm back. Now, uh, before we talk about uh, what leads up to the Battle of Alcor, uh, in this email that I'm going to send you uh, tomorrow, which will be uh, Sunday, because today's Saturday, uh, there's going to be the two video lectures. There'll be the three-page chronology uh, of events that we're talking about. And there'll also be a link to uh, the video done by the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum uh, on the Belle of Elcor, one of the centerpieces of their Key to Liberty uh, exhibit at the museum. So for sure, watch that video too. As I explained before, it's pretty well done for a local production and it... Uh, uh, stars many of my reenacting friends in this particular video, uh, including Art Cohn and Craig Russell and Dal Henry from the museum. So, uh, as we left off before, Arnold and what's left of the American forces from Canada limp into Crown Point uh, in early July. And it doesn't take long before General Washington knows, as Hancock had indicated previously, how vulnerable uh, New England and New York were to invasion by the British. And reconnaissance had reported that they were, you know, had followed the Americans right down the Richelieu and in all likelihood were preparing for this. So, Following the commands from General Washington, who commanded uh, General Horatio Gates, who was the commander of the Northern Army, uh, they, they command General Arnold to oversee uh, building an American fleet at Skeensboro. And the reason why they select Skeensboro, uh, there's an iron operation there that Philip Skeen owns, uh, there are wood mills, and it's obviously at the uh, far south end of Lake Champlain. So Arnold begins this task. Uh, he has to recruit shipwrights from Connecticut that he knew in his old business days and starts the production of what a lot of people like to argue is America's first Navy at Skeensboro. Now, uh, as I point out, he'll uh, produce one small galley constructed from timbers that they had captured on, at St. Jean on their retreat out of Canada. Uh, they'll construct eight new 54-foot gondolas or gunboats, known as both, and four 72-foot row galleys, including the Philadelphia. Now, each completed hull down in Skeensboro, after they completed them, uh, they would row them uh, to Mount Independence, which is that fortification right across from Fort Ty that we'll be talking about later on that ultimately will be connected by a bridge. But at this point, uh, it's not yet connected by a bridge. Uh, that's where they will fit the ships with masts because there's a spot on uh, Mount Independence known as the masting point where they'd pull the ships up to the steep cliff and install the masts on them. That's also where they'd put the riggings, put the artillery on them. A lot of the artillery came from those, you know, the guns captured at Crown Point and Fort Ty because remember, uh, only about, a quarter of them were shipped to Boston. Uh, and uh, Arnold will then combine four ships that he and Montgomery had captured in 1775 uh, from Skeensboro and St. Jean, the Liberty, the Enterprise, the Royal Savage, and the Revenge to complete his fleet. So, <clears throat> His fleet is completed by September. He'll then embark on Lake Champlain, start sailing around, maneuvering, trying to train foot soldiers to be sailors as best he could. 
and they'll be practicing, sighting in guns. That's why up and down Lake Champlain, you can find cannonballs because Arnold and his men were just touching off cannon to practice. I know friends of mine have found several in the Sandy Hills at Point Port Kent that came from these maneuvers. <clears throat> and he'll be sailing on Lake Champlain looking for a good spot to engage the British, who he knows by this point uh, from intelligence reports are assembling their own Navy to invade Lake Champlain. <clears throat> so, this is uh, the next spot on our uh, chronology. Uh, from July 1776 to October 1776, 12 free prefabricated uh, gunboats will arrive from England. And <clears throat> they were reassembled at Saint Jean, Quebec, which is beneath the rapids on the Richelieu. <clears throat> Under the command of Sir Guy Carleton, and Lieutenant Thomas Pringle, who is uh, from the British Navy, uh, the British fleet will consist of <clears throat> the large ship, the Inflexible, <clears throat> and the schooners Maria and Carlton, and a large radeau, which is basically a giant gun platform known as the Thunderer. <clears throat> There'll be 20 or more additional gunboats, longboats, bateaux, canoes. It's quite a fortress they put together, a floating fortress, to invade New York and Lake Champlain. <clears throat> and this whole flotilla will depart from St. Jean, Quebec, on October 4th and start making its way onto Lake Champlain. <clears throat> now, British intelligence reports have indicated that Arnold had built a fleet, sort of a ragtag fleet, but a fleet nonetheless, that they were then searching out to engage, which they thought would be easy pickings to conquer the waters of the Champlain Valley. So uh, on October 11th, uh, the British fleet will be sailing south on Lake Champlain. And on that morning, <clears throat> there is a very strong north wind, which we'll see will work to Arnold's advantage. The British fleet will come around Cumberland Head and be sailing in the Broad Lake uh, and will go right past Valcour Island. Now, I'm going to send you an artist depiction and also an old drawn map that'll show you right where the fleets end up. But Arnold had his fleet anchored in a crescent inside of Valcour Island, hidden away from the British. And uh, it was basically a crescent that, as you'll see on the map, goes from approximately where... Uh, just south of where the Peru dock is, now the boat launch, across to Valcour Island to a place known as Indian Bay. <clears throat> now, uh, the British, because of this strong north wind, will be blown right by Valcour Island. And Arnold will have to send uh, the Royal Savage out to get their attention because they didn't even know Arnold and the fleet were back there. The Royal Savage sails out south of Valcour Island. The British spotter around 11 a.m. and the battle begins. The Royal Savage, unfortunately, uh, <clears throat> when it was returning to where Arnold had the fleet anchored, ran aground on the south end of Valcour Island on a reef. And that's it for the Royal Savage. Uh, she'll be out of commission. Arnold will have to send uh, boats over to evacuate the men. He loses one of his main ships, really not even in battle. <clears throat> so the battle begins. Uh, they fight all day. Uh, 
once the British get in position, because they had to tack against the wind to get into position in Valcor Bay, their superior forces wreak havoc with Arnold and his fleet. Uh, Arnold will lose 60 men killed during that day on October 11th. And he, as I mentioned before, loses the Royal Savage right off the bat, and the Philadelphia sinks in the center of the channel between the mainland of New York and Valcor, where she'll later be uh, rediscovered by Colonel Hagelin, and that's how she ended up down in the Smithsonian on permanent display that many of you may have seen before if you've been there. <clears throat> now, uh, so... Arnold calls a war council, as it's known back in this day, uh, with his uh, uh, officers, Colonels Waterbury and Wigglesworth, and he tells them he's got a plan. Now, you'll see this all depicted in that video quite nicely, so you really need to watch uh, that Key to Liberty video that I'm sending you. Now, uh, <clears throat> he decides... What they need to do, because right at sunset, and it's October, fog settled in on the lake. Arnold decides that he can sneak right by the British fleet anchored to his south by hugging the New York shore. Now, the reason why they can pull this off, all of Arnold's ships are flat-bottomed. So they don't really have to worry. They don't draw much water. And on that side of the shore, they'll be able to roll by the British fleet, which is anchored out much further from the shore because they're being cautious. They already saw the Royal Savage run aground, and they don't want that to happen to any of their ships. <clears throat> so as you'll see in the video, and as I mentioned, uh, Arnold will arrange his ships in single file with the Trumbull at the head of the column. His men will wrap their sweeps, which are the big oars, uh, in oily rags so they don't creak and make noise while they're rowing. And then uh, at the back of each ship or the uh, stern uh, will be a small hooded lantern that can only be seen from directly behind it. So that way they can follow each other and you'll hear about this in the video. They pull this off. They sneak right out of there in the middle of the night. Now, there's a couple of reasons. The British were cocky, as usual. They had wreaked havoc with Arnold's fleet. They figured, okay, it's, it's nighttime. We'll rest up, get all ready to go, and in the morning we'll finish them off because they're no match for us. A couple other things happen. Being cocky, Pringle doesn't really put out proper sentries to keep an eye on Arnold and his ships. He could have had men go ashore, keep an eye on from there. He had Indians on Velcor Island that could report to him. He didn't bother. Also, one thing that's going to deflect their attention, uh, they had set the Royal Savage on fire. And it really burst into flames when Arnold and his men were sneaking away because some of the powder on board exploded, which diverted their attention towards Valcor Island, not the New York shore, where Arnold and his men were sneaking by him. It's a brilliant maneuver pulled off by Arnold, to say the least. So when the morning comes on October 12th, the British are all ready to just finish off the Americans. Much to their chagrin, when the fog lifts, they discover Arnold's gone. Where are they? Now, I know there's an old wives' tale that many of you may have heard of before. There's that small uh, island just south of Valcor that l some locals call Gunboat Island. That's not the real name of the island. If you look on the period map that I'm going to provide you, it's labeled Petite Island back then. Today, its official name is Garden Island. The reason why it's got this nickname, Gunboat Island, is that the wives' tale that's told is that the British 
uh, thought it was one of Arnold's ships that morning in the fog and blasted it with cannonballs, much to their chagrin, when the fog lifted and they discovered it was an island. That's nonsense. They looked at that island all day when they were battling. They were anchored not too far from it. They didn't fire a bunch of cannonballs at so-called gunboat island. Sure, some fire might have ran astray there, but no, that never, ever happened. So, uh, finally, when they uh, do some reconnaissance around the lake, they finally spot Arnold and his fleet all the way down. They had made it to Schuyler Island initially, where Arnold, once they made it to Schuyler Island, uh, had to assess more damage and uh, they decided at Schuyler Island to take all the guns uh, off the Jersey and the Spitfire and put them on other of Arnold's ships that were left. And uh, shortly after they took the guns off the Spitfire, she sunk to the bottom. That's the ship that the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum about 20 years ago rediscovered down in about 450 feet of water and it's still rusted there today in perfect condition because of how cold the water is. So the Spitfire is another one of Arnold's fleet that still exists. And there's been reports done for the Navy and Congress on plans to someday raise the Spitfire and restore her. But, uh, it's a very expensive undertaking. I've read the report. I forget what the price tag is, but uh, it's going to have to be better days in America to where we have that kind of money to spend on that. So, but who knows? And uh, they just abandoned the Jersey and set her adrift there. So the next morning when the wind shifts uh, and the British can sail once again, uh, they will catch up with what's left of Arnold's fleet near Split Rock Mountain, which many of you may know where it is in Lake Champlain, in the central part of Lake Champlain. Uh, at that point, the British will surround the Roe Galley Washington, and the Washington will have to surrender because she's overwhelmed. In the meantime... Arnold, who's in command of the rest of the fleet on the Rogue Galley Congress and four other uh, gunboats, will be fleeing from the British pursuit. And they're in hot pursuit and their ships can sail much faster because they're real sailing vessels where Arnold's uh, ships are flat bottom with a sail on it. They don't maneuver very well. So Arnold makes the decision to scuttle his fleet in Ferris Bay near the village of Panton, Vermont. And you'll see this depicted in the video. Arnold runs all the ships aground, evacuates everybody off the ships, leaves the American flags flying and sets them on fire in defiance to the British so they can't fall into the hands of the enemy. He and all the crew members, including wounded, and the local residents of Patton, Vermont, who will come down and assist uh, their compadres, will escape overland on the Vermont side to down to Fort Ticonderoga and Mount Independence. So, <clears throat> four of Arnold's ships will make it back to Crown Point and then down to Fort Ty. So, uh, on the surface, this seems like another gigantic defeat for the Americans. They're, you know, the majority of the fleet constructed that summer is destroyed by the British. They now command the waters of Lake Champlain. And it looks like it's just a matter of time before they conquer all of Lake Champlain, head down the Hudson, <clears throat> have troops come up the Hudson, cut off New England from the rest of the colonies, which is their strategy to win the war. But not so fast. On October 20th, Sir Guy Carleton arrives at Crown Point, 
which the Americans have abandoned, uh, after viewing by water the American fortresses of Mount Independence and Fort Ticonderoga. They've constructed a giant military complex that we'll be talking about, uh, you know, next week in the following classes, not this time, uh, at this spot where they're going to construct a bridge during the winter, and there'll be 10,000 soldiers stationed there. Now, Carlton knows to conquer that installation is going to take a lot of time. It's not something that's going to happen in a matter of days once he views uh, how impressive this installation the Americans have built here. So, uh, by October 20th, snow was already falling in the Champlain Valley, and winter was quickly approaching, so Carlton really had no choice but to retreat back to Canada to the winter quarters at St. Jean and wait out the winter and then stage the major invasion uh, the next spring and early summer of 1777, which turns into the entire Saratoga campaign that we'll be studying in the future. <clears throat> so, with Arnold in the Battle of Valcourt, with his ragtag group of soldiers turned sailors, with the Navy, he either stole the ships or constructed out of the woods of New York, he is able to delay the progress of the British invasion by a full year. This is a case of losing one battle to win a greater victory. That greater victory happens the next year in 1777 at Saratoga. <clears throat> so by delaying the British that uh, time period, it allows the Americans to fortify more installations and prepare for a massive British invasion, which they do, and they'll successfully repel uh, in September and October of 1777 at Saratoga. But without the Battle of Valcour delaying the British progress, they might have been able to go right straight to Mount Independence, Fort Ty in early October, engage them, defeat them, <coughs> excuse me, and who knows what would have happened. Obviously, it's all speculation. But that's why the Battle of Valcour is a very important battle, even though on the surface it appeared to be another horrible loss for the Americans. And remember, in the meantime, things aren't going too well in the South for Washington and his forces. So that's where I'm going to call her quits. So just uh, to wrap up here and to remind you, when you get the email tomorrow, uh, you'll obviously have uh, links to these two lectures linked to the very important uh, uh, Key to Liberty video from the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum. Uh, I'll attach this chronology of events and a couple of other things, and then we'll be ready to talk about this on Thursday at 10 o'clock in our next class. So I hope everybody uh, has a good rest of the weekend. Uh, I myself am rooting for the Kansas City Chiefs tomorrow because uh, a lot of my friends are Chiefs fans. I'm a lonely Lions fan, so I have nothing to root for. But I'll root for that young Pat Mahomes uh, and the Kansas City Chiefs. So, everybody take care. I'll see you on Thursday. Bye now.